I'm Kath P and today we're going to talk about wildlife gardening. So welcome to Wild Gardening. Every year uh, the Wildlife Trust and the Royal Horticultural Society have a different theme for wild, wild about gardens. Um, we've done bats and worms and ponds and this year we're looking at beetles. So if there's anything in the PowerPoint that you see that you want to know more about, specifically about beetles, um, watch out for that online um, coming up very shortly. Now, it's not all about beetles, so don't be too worried if you're not very keen on them. Um, but we're going to look at generally how your garden can be a wonderful place for wildlife. Now, there's over 10 million acres of garden in the UK, which is more land than all of the nature reserves put together. So your garden can be part of an enormous nature reserve. And we'll go into the PowerPoint now. And we'll have a look about how you can change your garden, perhaps, to add more wildlife to it. All gardens have wildlife. Even if all you have is paving slabs, there's bound to be some ants under there. So every single garden will have some form of wildlife in, but some are better than others. One of the main things is to look after an entire ecosystem. So you might be particularly keen on birds in your garden, but without having all the rest of the things that support the birds, you won't have nearly as much variety, nearly as many species as you would if you looked after the whole lot. So starting from the tiniest little things, the little fella on the top left there is a springtail. Uh, minute little things, absolutely essential for breaking down dead plant matter. Um, lots of them in compost heaps and leaf litter. Uh, right, down, right up to the, the bigger things, the birds, the small mammals, um, amphibians, frogs, toads, and of course all the insects in between. So you want to be looking after all of them, the whole lot. Variety is very important. If you think about how nature is, there aren't that many places that don't have variety. So the more different kinds of habitats you can offer in your garden, the better they're going to be for wildlife. What you want to do is to provide features that are found in nature already. So things like trees, hopefully mature trees, fruiting trees, flowering trees, trees with holes in them, trees with rugged bark, this sort of thing. You want grass, longer grass, shorter grass, for different habitats. You want taller plants, the flowers, the herbaceous things, you want hedges, all sorts of different things. And we're going to have a look at some of the things you can do. Gardens, of course, they're quite small spaces. Most of them are quite small spaces. So you're probably thinking, well, you know, I've only got this tiny little garden. What on earth good is that going to be doing to help wildlife? But don't think of your garden as an isolated island because wildlife won't see it that way. They move about and if your garden is good for wildlife and maybe next doors and next door to that, or perhaps next door's isn't so much, but the one next is, or you're backing onto a field, or you're in the middle of a housing estate, and everybody has nice gardens for wildlife, you're going to make quite an impact. Everything moves between gardens. So you might think, well, oh, I've got 10 blue tits that come to my garden. Um, you've probably got about 100 um, different ones, not all there at the same time, obviously, and they move in and out. They're, they've got a, a daily round that they're going from one to the other. So some things are living in your garden, they're there all the time. Springtails don't go very far, for example. But other things are going to be coming in and out. So your little patch of land can make a big difference. One of the best places for wildlife is on the edges of things. The um, ecologist term for these are ecotones. They're the edge between one environment and another one. And that's where you get most species and the most biomass. So the most 
combined weight of animals, if you like. And gardens are very good for ecotones because they're small spaces, they've got a lot of edge. So again, very valuable to keep the wildlife going. And this is just a, an example of a before and after. This is before it got hit by an enthusiastic wildlife gardener. And here's how it can look afterwards. A bit of, bit of planting, some climbers, makes a lovely space, not only for the wildlife, but also for you. It's a some way you can enjoy sitting and watching the wildlife on a nice sunny day and maybe sitting there with your cup of tea and seeing what's coming in and out. So remember that wildlife gardening isn't just for the animals, it's not just for the wildlife, it's for you as well. And even the smallest changes can make a huge difference. So the smallest change you can make, really, is to do absolutely nothing. If you just leave a bit of your garden wild, um, it's going to encourage all sorts of things to come in and use that wild spot. It doesn't have to be the whole garden. You don't have to live in a wilderness, a corner or a little edge or something. Leave the edges a little untidy. It's going to be absolutely great. And the other thing you can do that's uh, not doing it, if you like, is don't use pesticides. Wildlife thrives where it's organic. If you start using pesticides, you can upset the balance. You haven't got that whole ecosystem we were talking about. You've wiped out part of it. So if you can avoid using pesticides, let everything turn into a natural balance, that's by far the best thing to do. And by pesticides, I mean insecticides, herbicides, you know, weed killers, um, the things you spray on your roses because they've got mildew, um, the things you spray because you've got aphids. Um, generally speaking, hold your nerve and something will come along and sort out the problem for you. Uh, much cheaper that way and much better for wildlife. But if you want to do something a bit more positive, we'll start off with some small changes, just little things you can do, um, an hour here and there, a little bit of money, and you can make big, big results. And first of all, is some additional food for the birds. Um, about half of the um, households in the country that have gardens provide additional food for birds and about a quarter of them by put, you do this by putting out special bird feeders. You can get a huge range of them, um, all sorts of different things. The main thing to remember is that the more variety again that you put out, the more variety of birds you'll get. So if you're Say you've got one bird feeder out at the moment and you get five species of birds coming regularly, try putting out something different. If you've got a, a, a seed feeder, like the one on the top right here, put out some fat blocks. Anything like that will help. At this time of year, it's particularly important because the birds are getting into condition for breeding and the more good quality, high calorie food they have, the easier it is for them to put on the weight they're going to need. Um, breeding is a very stressful time for them. They need to, uh, the male birds will be singing, so they need all the energy for singing their heads off every morning. And the females, of course, are having to produce eggs and produce the, the young. So lots of nice bird food and you will have birds there. And don't forget some water for them. Um, some lovely starlings down here on the bottom left, having, having a bath, but fabulous thing to see. Bird boxes, again, very simple thing to do, huge variety of them, ones with holes, ones with open fronts, um, special ones for particular species, like ones for swallows and house martins and um, even tree creepers and things, and the wood creep boxes, which um, are a little more resistant to weathering and will last longer, They're rather more expensive, but um, 
they're, they're, you don't worry too much about what it looks like. The birds don't really see the box, they just see the hole. These are replacing holes in old trees, which of course are declining in the countryside because people tidy them up. So if you can put out a couple of boxes, you never know who you might get breeding in your garden. Very positive, positive thing to do, for very little effort. These are, of course, available from our shop in Shrewsbury. If you want to uh, go on the, the online shop at the moment, you can see the variety we have. The other thing we have are houses for insects. Um, these are solitary bees, um, particularly appreciate some, some, some nesting holes. Or you can make your own. This one on the top right here is just a simple bundle of bamboo canes tied together. and they're very popular with the, the mason bees, the solitary bees, and leaf cutter bees as well. So lots of things you can do, lots of ideas online to make your own, and ones to buy as well. Uh, this is a um, mason bee emerging from its tunnel. You can see how the bamboo cane here has been um, packed with mud, that's why it's a mason bee. It's not because it gets in your masonry. It's a mason bee because it uses masonry to block off its um, nesting chambers. So the bamboo cane will have several little chambers, each with an egg provided with um, pollen for the grubs to eat when they hatch. And you'll have five or six in a row down your bamboo tube or the tube in your bee home. And when they hatch out, they, they emerge like this. And this one was just in an ordinary bamboo pole in my garden. Fabulous thing to see, though. I mean, look at his little face when he comes out. Isn't that great? I mean, how could you not want one? You can make homes for hoverflies. These are um, the little sort of almost bee-looking creatures. That they're good pollinators. And their offspring breed in normally sort of in the wild they'd be in water filled rot holes in trees and this sort of thing so you can make the equivalent of it a um, hoverfly lagoon and basically it's got some cut grass and leaf litter in the bottom and then water and some dry leaf litter sort of floating on it and the hoverfly larvae will you know, hoverfly will lay its eggs in it and the, the larvae will live in there for a while. Most unattractively named things are called rat-tailed maggots, but uh, we won't blame them for that, it's not their fault. So another nice thing you can do, it takes up a very small bit of space and um, it's, it's something you can do very positively for pollinators in your garden. Look at your planting. Again, a very simple thing to do when you're tidying up your flower beds and things. Think of having different heights of things, different shapes of flowers, and don't forget that you can plant in amongst the paving as well. Um, looks rather nice with a bit of, bit of bit of some some thyme growing in between the paving slabs which times fabulous for bees, um, wonderful pollinators, lots and lots of pollen in it. And it looks lovely as well, and it's very controllable. So instead of having just blank areas of nicely tidy paving, think about a few flowers in between. It doesn't take much effort. You could just let what grow what grows, you know. Um, I have to admit, I don't worry about in between the paving, and I ended up with... Um, Babascan was growing in it, which wasn't exactly the sort of neat effect you get at the time. It grew to about seven feet high, but uh, fascinating anyway. Thinking about the planting, try to make sure there is something in flower for as long as possible during the year. So long flowering season makes um, the pollinators really happy. Early emerging bumblebees were looking for something to eat looking for some nectar and these are some of the early flowers you can put out 
which um, which will provide lots of nectar for the early bees. There's sort of little longworts on the top left, hellebores, crocuses, grape hyacinths, all these sort of things. Early spring flowers. And not only does it delight the bees, but it delights you as well. Because you, if you're anything like me, um, as soon as you start getting through winter, you start looking for the first thing in flower. So in my garden, it's usually um, witch hazels um, and winter aconites, snowdrops, these sort of things. But you want a nice succession through the year. These are some, some late flowering things for the late autumn because we still have bees out then. Um, sedums, the open dahlias like this, this is Bishop of Landaff, the one on the top right here. And it's got, a, it's got an open flower. The pom-pom ones and the cactus ones really are no good for bees. They need to be able to reach the pollen. So, fantastic show. They're going to look really great in any garden and they're going to be good for the pollinators. Japanese anemones, again, a late flower, a nice open flower, and of course, some Michaelmas daisies. Another simple thing to do, leave some of your lawn to grow a bit longer. Saves you cutting it, and it's really good for wildlife. It's going to be good for um, amphibians, the small frogs and things, when they leave ponds and need somewhere to hide. Um, it's going to be good for insects because it, 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 you're going to get flowers growing in it. You don't even need to uh, plant any deliberately. They, they'll, they'll be there. Um, the birds love it. They can pick the seeds off the, the grass when it, when it seeds. Small mammals, it's essential for. So a bit of long grass, it can look quite tidy. You don't have to just have a lawn that looks like a field. Put some paths through it so it looks deliberate. And then people don't say, gosh, lazy devils, they haven't mowed their lawn. They're going to look at it and say, oh, well, that's interesting. And then when they talk to you about it, you can explain that you've done it deliberately and that's why. And then hopefully you'll inspire them to do it too. So those were the simple things. Now, if you've got a little bit more time and you're a little bit more keen on it, Maybe you start off with the small things and then you can build up to a few slightly bigger projects. The first thing you need is a really good compost heap. Um, I'm guessing most of you probably have one already. It's good for the garden. It's got a wonderful feed for the garden, but it's also good for wildlife. This replicates the um, decaying leaves and vegetation on, the, on woodland floors and under hedges. So that's the, 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 what, it, what it's offering that wildlife would be expecting to find um, in the wild. And it's going to be full of insects, arthropods, um, and the wood lice, like the bottom left here, bottom right, little centipede. And um, also in the summer, they're a fabulous breeding place for grass snakes. Um, if you can leave your compost heap untouched between the end of April and the end of July, you might well find that the, the grass snakes will use it to lay their eggs in. Um, fabulous thing to have in your garden, especially if you've got a pond. They're very keen on ponds as well. So have a compost heap, have it absolutely full of these fantastic little creatures. Um, frogs and newts will use it uh, as, as somewhere to hibernate. So they'll, they'll get into the bottom of it and use it to hibernate in. It has its own, generating its own warmth, which is why the snakes like to breed in it. So there is nothing not to like about composting. An open one like this is so much better for wildlife than one of those plastic garlic jobs. Obviously, they make it quite difficult for anything to access. Mine is usually full of blackbirds, which are picking about in the compost and um, hunting out the, the, the centipedes and things. But there's room for everybody. How about a log pile? Now, here's where we get on to the beetles. Um, this year, we're particularly keen on beetles, and log piles are a brilliant place for beetles. 
um, the, particularly the um, this one, the bottom, bottom, bottom middle there is a violet ground beetle. They're a predator, they eat slugs, so they're going to help your organic garden without you using slug pellets. If you've got plenty of these fellas, they're going to scoff the slugs and you won't have a problem. Toads, brilliant things for eating pests. They love log piles, they'll be in the bottom one. Shrews, they're also insectivores. They eat things like little worms, they eat insects, they eat all sorts of pests in your garden. So a log pile is a really, really fine thing to have. Just nice stack that you're not going to disturb and just leave it there. Um, you can put it in a quiet corner where it's not going to be a feature, or you can put it deliberately where you can see it. Um, I don't think it looks ugly. It'll eventually get things growing over it, um, which just adds to its, its benefit for wildlife. Or how about a stumpery? Now, this does require you have access to some good, preferably hardwood logs, which you can set up right in the ground. Dead wood is getting increasingly rare in the countryside because people are so worried that bits of dead trees will fall on people, lawsuits, all this sort of thing. So this replaces what's being lost out there in nature. Things that are being tidied away that really have a vital place for so many species, so many beetles particularly. Um, Longhorn beetles, like this one bottom centre, breed in dead wood. Uh, stag beetles also breed in dead wood, the stag, stag beetle larva over on the left there. And they're becoming increasingly scarce because they just haven't got anywhere to breed. Of course, once you've got all these beetle larvae in your logs, the next thing you get is woodpeckers because they're particularly keen on beetle larvae. But again, like I say, we have room for everything. A mini pond. Every garden should have some water in it, even if it's only, I mean, a big bird bath. But this is a just an old metal feed trough type thing. There's a zinc bath, they used to be known as, and it can be treated as a very small pond. Um, you won't get quite the variety of wildlife in it as you would in a full sized one, but it's something you can do quite easily, even if you've only got a little courtyard garden with paving. You can have pots and tubs with all the things we were discussing about the um, when we were looking at planting. You can have early and late flowering things in your pots around and you can have a little pond which just adds another extra habitat. Quite a lot of creatures prefer small ponds so you'll have a, a, a different set of species will be using these, these environments. It particularly it, I, I, I was really taken by this, I found this when I was, when I was going, going through the web this is on the Wild, Wild, Wildfowl Wetland Trust website, and they've made a sort of pond and bog garden with a, a downspout. And the idea is that you have the, the pond is the top bit, and then the bottom bit, the overflow of it, is a little bog garden. And you have a what charming thing. And you've got two extra habitats, and they put the bricks around it, which form sort of an, an insect habitat in their own right and i thought well what a brilliant thing to do and really for the cost of you know a couple of plastic boxes you could have a really nice garden feature it's, that's it's worth looking up on the website it really is honestly every garden should have at least one tree you can get some very small ones so if you've got a tiny garden, you can grow one in a big tub. Um, you can grow, um, they have sort of apples and things with dwarving root, root stocks, and you get the flowers and you get the fruit. So the ones I've, I've put up here, this is a, a Kilmarnock willow, 
um, it's a, a goat willow and it has particularly good very early pollen which is brilliant for pollinators um, crab apple trees like the, the, the one in flower here um, another good pollen source and of course you get wonderful fruit on them and at the bottom we've got rowan which is another one which you have very good blossom for the insects and fruit for the birds in the autumn so this is like year-long interest it's going to be a beautiful feature in your garden it adds another dimension you get the, the, the height thing that makes your garden feel completely different so think about it if you haven't got a tree in your garden you can find a really small one and it uh, but do try and find one that has good flowers or good fruit or both preferably both and you're going to have an enormous benefit to wildlife through that bulbs in your lawn naturalized they'll spread they'll look wonderful all you need to do is plant them in the autumn and then when they've flowered don't mow that area until the leaves have dropped uh, leaves have gone back to the ground once once the leaves have withered you can you can mow that area of lawn again and they make a lovely splash of color and they're brilliant for wildlife a mini garden meadow again brilliant for wildlife this is going to be really popular for full of insects all year round um this is different from bulbs in your lawn or um what they sell sometimes as um pictorial meadow seeds um the idea of a meadow is it's perennial it depends on the soil being fairly poor which allows the wildflowers to flourish while keeping the grass uh, fairly subdued um, at the bottom left here this is yellow rattle which is a fabulous plant to have if you're trying to establish a meadow because it's a semi-parasite hemiparasite we call it semi-parasitic on the grass roots so it does make its own chlorophyll it's got its own chlorophyll it makes its own food but it also leaches some of the goodness out of grass and can um, stop it growing too vigorously eye bright in the middle here does pretty much the same thing um, these are typical permanent meadow flowers pink nut on the bottom right and then at the top you've got devil's bit scabies all sorts of lovely flowers will grow in a meadow you can plant plug plants you can scrape up bits of turf and stamp seeds into them um, or you can go the whole hog and strip off your topsoil and grass and start from scratch um, lots of ways to do lots of advice online about it so it's not difficult um, it's a bit more complicated than just leaving it to it it has to be said but really really well worthwhile and you're going to get an absolute bounty of insects in there there's butterflies will love it bees will love it um the ground beetles will have a fantastic time um and it's going to look a picture a special one for a beetle being as it is beetles this year is miniature beetle banks now because beetle banks are something farmers are being encouraged to have in their fields to have the predatorial beetles give them somewhere to live so they can come out into the crop and, and eat the pests uh, but you can make a small one in your garden the main thing they need is rather tussocky grass and the, the picture on the top right here is a beetle banking construction and this was a little bit of effort it's basically you decide where you want it and then you put um things like cut raspberry or bramble canes branches things like this which you cover with um some wads of straw or hay cover it with again with with 
rotted compost, um, leaf litter, leaf mould, this sort of thing. <clears throat> and then you might want to put a net over it to stop it blowing away or washing away. And then plant in the top um, these tussock forming grasses, native grasses and native wild plants. And you'll have a permanent home for the garden beetles. If these are predatorial species, they're going to keep your garden slug free for you. So we've got the, um, the ground beetles and also the rove beetles. Um, the middle one here, fantastic thing, is the devil's coach horse. Um, they do this wonderful threat behaviour with their tail up in the air. They're great things to see, quite, quite a large beetle. Um, and the bottom right is some smaller rove beetles, there's many species of them in the, in the country. And they're all looking for somewhere nice to be. They like somewhere quite well drained and they like these grassy tussocks. So this is a way you can encourage them into your garden. And watch out a bit later in the year, we'll, we'll have a lot more on encouraging beetles in your garden. Now, you've had the taster, you've had the small project, you've had the medium sized project things you could do, you know, if you've got a weekend to spare. These are the things you want to be thinking about if you're planning a whole wild garden makeover. If you've got lots of time and a bit of money, these are some major projects that you can think about. First has to be a garden pond. This is the one thing that's going to bring more wildlife to your garden than any other feature. It's essential for most wildlife in this country to have somewhere to drink. So fabulous thing to have a pond. Birds like to bathe in it. So make sure there's a shallow edge. Lots and lots of different plants like to grow beside water or in the water. So you've got different species that are going to appeal to different creatures. The main thing is to um, if you're if you're building a pond specifically as a wildlife pond, is to remember to leave different depths of water in it, and maybe you could also think about leaving a sort of particularly shallow area that will become a bog. So you also have a bog garden joined onto it. If you're worried about um, if you have small children and you're worried about the safety of a garden pond, you could just go for the bog garden. So you don't really have open water but you have a, a wetter area with a lining so you can grow bog plants in it. I mean, think about the wonderful yellow irises, um, marsh marigolds, um, beautiful, beautiful things that grow on the edges of, of water, maybe with their feet in the water or just in very wet, wet areas. So. Once you've got a garden pond, it's surprising me how quickly it will become a hub for wildlife. You'll get uh, dragonflies. It's a fabulous dragonfly larva, top left here. Top right is damselfly larva. And these are wonderful, flying, coloured, superb creatures to have around your garden in the summer. Um, they will come to gardens without ponds. They travel quite a long way from water, especially some of the uh, the larger dragonflies. But damselflies like to be beside water, so a pond would be a great thing to have a few of those about. It's great for the amphibians. They need somewhere to breed. So frogs, newts, toads will all come to garden ponds to breed. It doesn't take them very long to find them. Um, and you'll have your own crop of tadpoles to watch, baby frogs to hop around the garden and hide in your long grass, and an endless fascination. Um, I can think of nothing better than spending a sunny afternoon peering into the depth of a pond. Just being beside water makes you feel good. So do have a think about it. You don't need to really do very much at all. Once you've got the pond in, maybe a couple of plants here and there, it will colonize on, on its own. Creatures will find it. Um, 
main thing is don't have fish. Um, really, goldfish, koi carp have no place in, in a wildlife pond. They'll just eat all the other little things. Um, quite a lot of the little things will be busy eating each other anyway, but you don't want to add to their problems by having fish in there. And you just have to worry about the herons then because they'll be in trying to eat goldfish. So This is a bit of an alternative. This is not, to, not a pond. This is a rain garden. And the point of a rain garden really is protecting the environment rather than making a resource for wildlife. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't have a liner. It's not designed to have permanent water. It, but it's designed to have somewhere that will hold water after a high rainfall event. So you're not getting a lot of runoff and it's not adding to um, flooding problems. So it's holding back where a large quanti quantity of water has joined, you know, has, has been deposited, if you like. So this, this can, it's not going straight into the st storm drain, it's being held in the ground. Um, really, you need to be thinking of somewhere that's got a fairly flat area, and you, it's, it's going to be planted with things that don't need to be in water all the time, but are happy to be in places that stay waterlogged for a little while. So meadow sweets are good, the elders are good, um, marsh marigolds again are good, they'll, they'll stand being dry, um, but they don't want to be anything that isn't wanting to be standing in water all the time. So this is a good thing to do for the environment, and it's another environment for the wildlife. Um, ephemeral water is just as important. Again, lots of ideas how to do it, you can find online. Um, and makes a very attractive feature again. How about a new flower border? I don't expect many of us are going to be able to do one as grand as this, but when you're plan if, you, if you're planning a new border, you can plant it specifically thinking about wildlife. So, um, the World About Gardens thing a few years ago was about bats. And one of the suggestions was plant a border for bats. So this was um, with herbaceous plants that are night scented. So they're bringing in the moths and the beetles and things that the bats will eat. Um, of course, again, You've got a wide variety of, of, of flowers. Hopefully long season is going to be good for the, the, the bees. Um, it's going to be good for things like ladybirds and butterflies and also very beautiful. Um, so even if you don't have very much space at all, maybe a little corner just with carefully chosen herbaceous plants. Um, perhaps something that gives a honeysuckle that you can have climbing up your fence and um, night scented stocks perhaps and these will be bringing in the nighttime wildlife so you could have bats flickering around your garden when you're sitting out in the uh, late summer evenings and don't forget that bats are a brilliant thing to have in your garden because each one of those little bats is going to be eating loads and loads and loads of things like midges and gnats and mosquitoes. So all those little beasties that are going to put you off sitting outside in your garden in the evening will be scoffed by bats instead of coming and bothering you. Hedges. Lots of us don't have space for a, a great big hedge, but you know, maybe you could fit in a little one. Native species are really good. Um, a lot of them have flowers and fruit or nuts, hazels, and dogwoods and field maples and things like this. So if you've got it, if you're thinking of respect, replacing a boundary, have a think about a hedge. There's a wonderful edge feature. They act as a sort of linear woodland, if you like. They're great for nesting birds, for feeding birds, 
hedgehogs and things. Obviously, the small mammals love to be under them. Um, holly blue butterflies need hollies and ivy, interestingly enough. Um, so a hedge can provide both of those things. You have these spectacular little blue butterflies in your garden. And, of course, lots of beetles as well. Don't forget the beetles. Um, the, the shield bugs, like this one on the top right, the green shield bug, they're, they're, they're great creatures. They're, they're wonderful fun. Kids love them because they'll happily walk about on your hand. Um, loads of different kinds of them. If you want to have a close look at them, if you want to get the kids involved in something like that, find a good hedge, put a white sheet under it, and give the branches a good shake. And all the insects will fall off onto the sheet and you can see them all running about. Then if you're really enthusiastic, you can catch them in a, one of those magnifying pots with the, with the lid on with the magnifier. And you can find out what they all are, or you can just have a look at them and be amazed at how good they look. So have a look at that one. Just a small hedge could make a huge difference. Big project here. Dig up all that paving. It's all you're doing here is leaving somewhere for the water to run off. Um, you know, it's got nothing for wildlife. It, they're making a bit of an effort here with a with a flower bed, and obviously they've got a trellis up the back, but really, it's not helping anything. So dig up the hard standing, hard paving. And now we're getting into really big projects. Now, this is a green roof for a garden studio or a garden shed, perhaps. You have to be a bit careful here. And you really have to, uh, it's a bit hard to retrofit, if you, if you see what I mean. You have to design your building, really, with the green roof um, integral to it. it it's, a, it's a heavy thing. If you're, I mean, I know a lot of us that are working at home now, you're perhaps thinking about a garden studio, a garden office, and what a great way to enhance it. And instead of taking out that chunk of environment that was available for wildlife before you built something on it, you've replaced it by something that is equally valuable. This is, a, they're usually um, sown with sedums, these sort of things, fairly drought tolerant, and they're, they're laid on free draining compound. So it makes a good place for the beetles and the insects to breed. They can burrow into it, um, they can, it, it, it's, they're not going to get washed away. The birds love it because they can pick about in amongst the gravel and if you've got lots of sedums on it, you've got lots of flowers to pollinate the insects again. And what 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 better way to in, enjoy your outdoor buildings? If you do decide to put it on your garden shed, please check that the roof can take it. I mean, they're they're putting these on you know huge buildings in London now, and it, but that's something for the architect to be worrying about, not us. Um, if there's any architect watching, do think about it. Though. And final giant project, another one for the architect. How about a green wall? Again, you really have to think about it quite carefully. But instead of just having climbers going up your wall, which is a brilliant thing to have, every garden ought to have some ivy. Ivy is brilliant for wildlife. It's very late flowering. The flowers come out in the autumn and then the berries appear at the end of winter and in the spring the ripe berries so they're there as a food source when there's not much else about so do have some ivy but look what you could do if you got really carried away just think how your, your how your house could look uh, i'd love to i'd love to do this but it's it's a, it's a major operation um but it just goes to show, with a little bit of thought, exactly how much you can do for wildlife in a small space. This isn't taking up any floor space at all. It's all vertical space. And give it a while, and you'll have things like wrens building nests in it. You can have all the insects crawling all over it. 
it's just going to be a wonderful resource. So um, do do think about that. But yeah, I know it's a bit un unrealistic. But if we all make a small change, we don't have to do something enormous like this. If we all make a small change, and our neighbours make a small change, and their neighbours make a small change, we can, between us, do something great and make a real resource for wildlife just in our own spaces. The main thing is enjoy it. Enjoy the variety. Enjoy the life around you and keep at it. If it doesn't work this year, do something different next year. You can change your planting. Don't change too much. One of the actual main problems for wildlife gardens is that because houses can change hands quite rapidly, um, all the good some one person's done maybe gets dug up with the next owner. So, you know, if you move somewhere that's got a good wildlife garden, watch it for a year or so before you do anything. If you move somewhere that's got a garden with no wildlife, put something in, get the neighbours to do it as well, and then sit and enjoy it. Sit out there, cup of tea in your hand, just watching what goes by. It's a beautiful, restful space, and having wildlife in it can only make it better. Usual message, make a difference, join us today. Make a difference in your garden, make a difference in the countryside, make a difference to the whole country. The whole county needs more wildlife. We're aiming at 30% more space for wildlife by 2030. Um, you can help with that. The more members we have, the more we can do. So have a think about it and um, don't think about it too long. Go online and sign yourselves up. Lots and lots of useful information about how to do all these things. And keep an eye out on what we've got coming up online about wildlife gardening in the next few months. And don't forget, cherish your beetles. Thank you very much.